1860, we have about 5 billion passenger pigeons. 25 years later, in 1885, there's hardly any left. So in less than a single human lifetime, this species that was infinite to the people living back then, I mean, you can't register a billion in your brain, you really can't. So, you know, this infinite species, this inexhaustible and endless resource was gone. Hey, Carl, how you doing? I'm doing great, Iram. How about you? I'm doing well. I've been busy. I know you've been traveling all around the Northeast. Yeah, I'm doing a huge triangle this week. I went up to the University of Vermont in Burlington yesterday, drove from the Adirondacks to the University of Vermont to do a school tour and also to meet with the founder of a cultivated meat company, which I'm going to keep anonymous for now. We'll get more details into that later. And by the way, they're doing some very exciting stuff at UVM. So that was exciting. And it was a good school tour. I drove from UVM for Burlington in Vermont, back to the Adirondacks, and then back to Brooklyn yesterday. So it was a quite intense day in the car. I'm in Brooklyn for the next couple of days. Then I'll be taking my son Tomas back to Cornell. And then I will be driving back to the Adirondacks, where I'll be for a couple of days. And then I'll drive back to Brooklyn and hopefully be here for a while. I'm not going to say it's the end of the summer because it's not, but there's a lot going on. But yeah, I've put in the miles in the last 24 hours. How about you? What have you been doing? I hear you. I also drove up to the Catskills, which if there's no traffic, it's like an hour and 45 minutes to where we were staying. But, you know, with traffic, it was about three hours. So I hear you. I don't drive in our day-to-day. You don't really drive in the day-to-day. Living in Brooklyn, we have the luxury of either biking or taking the train to wherever we need to go. To me, it was nice because I don't do it that often. Traffic wasn't as frustrating. I remember when I used to drive all the time, I had a lot of road rage, but (laughs) I was able to keep my cool because now was going on vacations. Uh, a friend of mine has a place near the mountains. It's beautiful, has a pool and it's great for like a few families to stay. So we had a family join us that have two little boys and I have a little boy. So little boys running around and our one friend, I like to call him a uh, Bon vivant because he loves to cook. And I love cooking because I come from a place of chemistry and I just love being like, it's almost like a laboratory. It is a laboratory. A kitchen is a lab. So we were geeking out over different cooking styles and methods. And my husband loves being like a foodie in terms of trying all the foods. Um, Of course, I love eating, but I love the experience of cooking. It was a great time. I think there's a lot of biotech coming online when we talk about food and ingredients. Of course, we talk about cultivated meat a lot. And the product discussions, like what does it taste like? What is it going to feel like? And so this conversation will continue in terms of our joy of cooking and eating. So you were hanging with your son and then two other little boys? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, And I was hanging with three teenage boys because they had spent a week doing trail maintenance around Mount Joe, which is very close to Lake Placid. And then the three of them went with me up to the University of Vermont. But there's been a lot of stuff going on. You mentioned that you started watching this Painkillers show on Netflix, which I haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, just trying to enjoy the summer, relaxing and watching new shows on Netflix. The Painkillers was the first first thing that was recommended to us. And wow, can I tell you that I've been talking to a lot of people about it. I'm sure our listeners might have come across it or started watching it. Basically, the whole thing is obviously OxyContin is heroin and they've made it into a FDA approved drug. I'm sure a lot of listeners, myself included, I don't know about you, Carl, but this addiction to oxys or other things does ruin people's lives, not only the person that's taking it, but the family. So they really point that out in the show. And so I think a lot of people can relate to how devastating it was, but to see all the decisions that were made by people at companies and FDA and the pharmaceutical sales reps going out there, the doctors that are prescribing it, all these decisions that were made that enabled this huge epidemic of epic proportions and all these peoples and communities that were just ravaged by this. And I was just so shocked. There's nothing great about this, but one thing the CEO of Purdue do pharmaceuticals said that it's all sales and marketing. The first pharmaceutical drug that was a blockbuster drug was Valium. And that's all because of sales and marketing. Not to say like, obviously the effects of all that are horrible, but the efficacy of sales and marketing is clear. I want to highlight that because that is what we do in the day-to-day at Messaging Lab. It's all marketing. So anyone that's listening is someone in our network or a founder, that is everything. Your technology is great, but if there is no sales and marketing, no one's going to hear it 
about it and no one's going to care because they also hint at storytelling in the show and how the stories of you're in pain. They really try to position Oxy as a wellness medicine. Oh my God, it's so bad. It's so bad. But it was a story that really got it out there. The reps telling the stories to the doctors, all of that was what enabled this mass consumption and access to this drug. Yeah, I have a couple of things to say. So first of all, it was just in the news that the Supreme Court blocked a $6 billion opioid settlement that basically would have given the Sackler family complete immunity to the harm that they caused. So that's pretty significant. The other thing I would say about OxyContin is once I threw out my back and it was bad, I was crawling from my bed to the toilet. I could not mm -hmm. move. And I was prescribed OxyContin and it provided immediate relief. As I walked around, because I do a lot of walking in Brooklyn, I thought about all the other people that were in pain and all the people who depend on drugs like that. And I just felt so much sympathy and empathy towards them because the pain was horrifying. And I could see why people would get addicted to a drug that would do such a good job of dulling the pain and just making you forget that you had it. For me, I was on it maybe for like a few days, but I just could see how people could just enjoy it so much because if you're in pain, your focus is on the pain and it really, really takes away your ability to focus on anything else. Well, here's the notorious part though, right? The Oxy was sold as a 12 hour release drug that you should only be prescribed it twice a day. However, that's not the case for all people. They would be in pain maybe four hours later. So they felt that pain again, but they were told that they couldn't have it until the 12 hours was complete. But the Sacklers knew that for a fact. They chose to ignore it because they knew that there was a cycle of people running away from pain towards pleasure. And that pain pleasure cycle creates an addiction. So if they even made a decision to be like, okay, take as needed, Maybe that would have reduced the addiction qualities. I don't know. But it's like they said the 12-hour dosage was a key thing in order to create this dependency. I mean, I don't know if that was intentional, but what they highlight in the show is they did all of these clinical studies and they chose to ignore it. They had reps saying that only 1% of people are addicted when it was basically most people became addicted. They chose to ignore the science. They chose to ignore the data. They did look at the science of pain and pleasure and were like, okay, we need to be right in the middle and make sure that people that are in pain, they get that pleasure, but they go back into that pain and they get that pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure. It's just the way that the show has painted this picture and pulled the curtain up. It's not just people that are addicted. It was very intentional the way that this drug was rolled out. But I was talking to someone about this earlier and I was like, oh, have you watched Pain Killers? They're like, oh my God, I have chills just thinking about how notorious this was, just like you mentioning the name of the show. Wow. Like I have goosebumps. And I was like, yeah, it is very chilling and horrible. All right. So I'm going to move us away from Sacklers and Netflix and talk about a couple of biotech news items. One is that the American Chemical Society and PVS Digital Studios just put out a video called Bioconcrete Revolution. And you may remember if you've listened to the Grow Everything podcast that we did an interview with Lauren Burnett of Prometheus Materials, and they're producing concrete using microorganisms, which I think is really interesting. And we'll put the video in the show notes because it's really worth watching. The other thing I wanted to mention, which is a little bit of a longer story, is the fact that last week on August 9th, synthetic biology pioneer Amaris announced it was filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Our friend Massimo Portincasso of Deep Venture Studios, I don't know if it's studios, and also Arsenale Bio, wrote a good piece about what this bankruptcy means. And just for people who don't know, Amaris was a kind of a first generation synthetic biology company. They were were born out of a series of companies that were created in the early 2000s that were focused on biofuels. And Amaris had always struggled. They had started to create a division that was really focused on personal care and beauty, which seemed to be doing pretty well, but they were never really able to get it together. I hate to say it that way. But Masomo makes the point that we're going to see three directions happen when it comes to the future of biotech and synthetic biology. One is that we're going to see a lot more self 
free biotech, which means that you've got a number of companies that are just taking elements out of cells and mobilizing them on a surface and then running chemicals through them to produce a new chemical. So that's one option. The second option is to look for organisms that exist in nature or to create tools around those organisms. And so the examples are friends at Cultivarium who are looking at creating tools to make it easier to work with non-model organisms, but also companies like Wild Microbes and Microbiar who are domesticated microbes that exist in nature. And this is a really interesting route to take, in my opinion, because we still really don't understand the microbial world very well. There's a lot out there that we don't know. And so there's a lot to explore. And then the third option, which Masomo mentions, working with nature, he calls it nature co-design. I personally know this really well because I worked with Massimo a few years ago on a report called Nature Co-Design. And this idea is to be able to really identify the best organisms, tap into billions of years of evolution, find the best solutions, and then use new tools like, let's say, machine learning or artificial intelligence to really make it possible to work with nature at any scale, whether it's in the lab or in a thousand ton fermenter. And there's a few new companies that are emerging in that space. And so Officina Bio is another company I've worked with that Massimo is involved in. He's got this company, Arsenala Bio, who I mentioned. And then we've got this company in Brooklyn called Melon Frost, who we should get on the pod, who are also working on co-designing with nature. And I think it's a really interesting take. So we'll link to this in the show notes. I'm sorry for the people at Amaris. They had a good ride. They were around for almost 20 years. And I hope that whatever comes out of their bankruptcy proceedings is better than what they had had to go through. It's a shame. That's like kind of the boom and bust of biology. We're going to see more of that, I'm sure. I think that companies that niche down and focus on a certain market, they'll always end up winning. But then when they go wide, because they have a very strong foundation of niching down, that they can go wide in terms of going into different markets. I'm sure that happened to Amaris. But sometimes when you go too wide, it's hard in terms of creating like a self-managing company. People tend to become complacent when they're in their bureaucracy and they start missing the innovation that's out there. I don't know all the ins and outs of the Amaris bankruptcy, what was actually going on in terms of were they stagnating? Was their sales team not trained well? Were their products not that great? Or they just cost too much money to make so they didn't innovate on the production side? We know a lot of people that either have worked there or worked with them. So maybe it's something to investigate. It's always good to know why things fail just so you can learn lessons. I hope that everyone at Amaris has a next place. Next they have somewhere act. a yeah. next act, a second act. I hope they do. I'm sure because biotech industry is booming. There is a workforce shortage. So all those people who sure can find a home or start another company. So I hope if you did work at Amaris and you're listening to this, do not fret. There is a place for you in the world now. So good luck to all the people that work there. All right. And so as as we transition to the podcast, as we started recording this, I got an email from, I'll say our friends. We know one person who's over at the venture firm called Not Boring. They just created a spreadsheet that is basically a science fiction idea bank. And I'm surprised no one's done this before, where they basically looked at the history of science fiction and ideas that are listed in science fiction, and then decided to figure out whether those ideas have been already created or whether they're about to be created or whether they may never be created. And this is a publicly available data base. I haven't really studied it yet. I just read the email and it looks super interesting. So we'll link to it. And I'm sure we'll have some more comments on this over the next few podcasts as we dig into it. But I think it's a brilliant idea because I'm always like, I read science fiction, but I really don't read enough science fiction. I want to read more science fiction. And I often feel that what we do at Messaging Lab is helping bring science fiction into reality because we're always working on projects that are really focused on the future. And the podcast interview that we're about to do is with someone who is doing something that will sound like science fiction. Ben Novak is with an organization called Revive and Restore, which was founded by Ryan Phelan, who is a biotech entrepreneur, and Stuart Brand, who should need no introduction, but is an author, ecologist, and founder of the Whole Earth Catalog back in the late 1960s. And Revive and Restore is focused on helping people in the conservation space use the tools of biotechnology to be more effective in what they do. It's a fantastic interview. What Revive and Restore is doing is amazing. Ben's going to talk a lot about the passenger pigeon, but the entire interview is super interesting and well worth listening to. All right, let's do the interview. 
Hi, Ben. Great to have you here on our podcast, Grow Everything. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, why don't you tell us what you're working on right now? As we were getting started with the recording, we were going back and forth. And instead of starting off with who you are and what you do, why don't you tell us what you're doing right now? All right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually really excited about the work I've been doing the last year or so. I've started a complete new program for the organization I work for, Revive and Restore. It's called our Biotechnology for Bird Conservation Program. I am now managing eight different teams in Japan, Korea, the United States, and Germany, all working to advance reproductive and gene editing technologies in birds to suit their unique egg-laying biology. Because the technologies we have in mammals, which is another group I'm working in for cloning, the Chevalsky's horse and the endangered black-footed ferret, those technologies that we use for mammals, they don't just translate to birds. And the mission of Revive and Restore is to develop a biotechnology toolkit, everything from genomics to biobanking, in vitro tech, gene editing, reproductive technologies, the whole suite for wildlife and a broad spectrum of endangered animals and plants. So well, yeah, I'm excited to be expanding that to birds right now. That's awesome. I'm a huge bird fan, <laughs> meaning I pay attention to them. I can't really identify them. <laughs> we do have a bird feeder in our Brooklyn backyard that we keep fed, and I love seeing who shows up. But why don't you give us some background on Revive and Restore? You gave us a couple of projects that you're working on right now, but it'd be interesting to understand why does Revive and Restore exist and why is there a need for an organization like Revive and Restore? Yeah, well, Revive and Restore is a nature conservation organization, a nonprofit organization. We are in the same class as World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, Audubon Society. But what makes us different from some of those bigger, older, more mature institutions is we have a unique mission to bring biotechnology to conservation. We started in 2012, co-founded by Ryan Phelan and Stuart Brand, with this ambitious idea of bringing back extinct species. So Ryan, she came from the world of medicine and trying to advance genomics and biotech and medicine as an entrepreneur. Stuart Brand, of course, his reputation precedes him as one of the help founders of the environmental movement. And then one of the people that had a schism with it when it went anti-science. He is a futurist, but his degree from Stanford back in the 60s is in ecology. So wildlife and conservation were always a motivation for him. The two blended those passions together to found, revive, and restore when George Church, one of the fathers of modern DNA technology, mentioned to them in passing that he felt the technology was probably here back in 2012 or coming to be able to recreate an extinct species. And George had always wanted to recreate the woolly mammoth. Stuart decided he would love to make a nonprofit organization around the idea of recreating the extinct passenger pigeon, which is what brought me into the picture because I am one of the world's leading experts on passenger pigeons. Back then, I was simply one of the world's most enthusiastic scholars of passenger pigeons. But the idea was to shoot for the moon with recreating an extinct species, partly because it was going to take advancement in so many different biotech subgenres. And Ryan, seeing all of those different types of biotech being adopted, and innovated in medicine just thought, well, of course, conservation is probably doing this too. Agriculture is. And the reality was that literally every step of technology that you would need to recreate something like a passenger pigeon was either something very underutilized in the field of conservation or entirely foreign to conservation. So the broader mission very quickly became developing and promoting the entire biotech toolkit within conservation. In 2013, we were able to add our first living endangered species to our repertoire of growing projects, and that was the endangered black-footed ferret. And I've been working on that species since then, so for 10 years now, in addition to wow. passenger pigeons and other things. That's so fascinating. We were talking about the convergence of multiple disciplines. And even though this is biotechnology, there's a lot of tools that became more accessible and combining them all for this purpose of de-extinction and helping endangered species is very phenomenal. So you mentioned that you had this great interest in passenger pigeons. Why? What sparked that interest? And why did you go down this route? 
Yeah, well, the very quick run through relates to where I grew up. I grew up in Western North Dakota. I was the fifth generation of my paternal line to be born and live there. While that is not one of the places where passenger pigeons were most prominent, it afforded me the chance living near Theodore Roosevelt National Park to really be exposed to both a political and hands-on history of conservation. And in Theodore Roosevelt National Park, bison, elk, and bighorn sheep had all become locally extinct in the late 1800s to early 1900s, and by the 1960s to 1980s had been reintroduced. So when I came around and was enjoying seeing bison in the park or elk or bighorn sheep and these incredible species, I was looking at the end product of a lot of human labor to restore something that had been extinct. That gave me a sort of an appreciation of what restoration is. About the time I was becoming a junior high student, that was right when the human genome was being sequenced, and that was in the news all the time. I was always a nerd and a geek, so I loved science, and I loved natural history especially. I was paying attention to that. I was also, for everyone out there, when you grew up in Western North Dakota, you have access to find fossils of species from millions of years ago. So I would always be out in the hills collecting fossils, and I loved dinosaurs. I didn't really know a lot about recently extinct species, but I knew about endangered species. I loved dinosaurs a lot of different passions. A few things coalesced all together. And it was one, the human genome project going on, early experiments with transgenic mice and things were making a stir. At the same time, people did a PCR of a gene from the extinct thylacine or Tasmanian tiger, as most people know it. And they basically inserted that into a mouse genome and showed that the piece of thylacine DNA could function in the mouse. And that made headlines and made people think, could we recreate the extinct thylacine. And that was my first introduction to the concept of de-extinction. And it was also one of my first real introductions to recently extinct species. These weren't dinosaurs that were really long gone, but that there was this host of species that humans had driven to extinction. I'd heard a lot about pandas and polar bears and how, oh, these species could go extinct. And then there would be a domino effect. Nobody in my school, none of the news I was reading was talking about this huge gap in nature. And I use that phrase because I bought the book by Tim Flannery and Peter Shouten called A Gap in Nature to start learning about those species. And I was just hooked. I was hooked on learning about these tragic stories of recently extinct species. And I couldn't help but believe there really was a hole or a gap in nature left by these many, many extinctions. And when the thylacine project came out and it was like, oh, we, you know, recreated this piece of DNA, I just thought, but we're going to get there. We will be able to use biotechnology to recreate an extinct species. And that's like the next step. If you're putting wolves back in Yellowstone, which was the big controversy at that exact time after they had been gone for 75 years, I was like, the next step is something that you can't just grab from northern Canada or somewhere else and put into a historic spot. It's going to be something like a dodo bird or Tasmanian tiger. And I did a science fair project on recreating the dodo bird. I discovered that the dodo bird was an actual pigeon. And that was when Beth Shapiro's paper on dodo DNA had come out, proving, yes, it is indeed a type of pigeon. That led me down the pigeon hole that brought me to passenger pigeons. It was not the extinction of passenger pigeons that hooked me. There's a small group of people in the world who are passenger pigeon fanatics. They latch on to this story of the passenger pigeon. And many of them really latch on to the story of Martha, the last passenger pigeon ever to live that died in 1914 at the Cincinnati, Ohio Zoo. I didn't really care much for how they went extinct. I was much more fascinated by what they were when they were thriving because the first passage I read about them was about a flock of two billion passenger pigeons flying over this one town. And I was just like, there's nothing like that today. And that just fascinated me. And yeah, I was hooked in my education, went down the, the path of trying to customize it in my university years towards knowing everything about the kind of ecology of extinct species, because I felt the biotech was actually going to be much farther into the future. I was like, I'm going to be like 50 when the biotech <laughs> is here. And I was like, when these new young people figure out the biotech to recreate extinct species, they're going to need someone that really understands extinct species and conservation and nature to kind of shepherd such a project. And then like in the middle of my first stint of graduate school, Ryan and Stuart founded Revive and Restore. And I found out about that through another friend, a 
passenger pigeon fanatic, Joel Greenberg, who wrote uh, a book, Feathered River Across the Sky, and was creating a public movement called Project Passenger Pigeon for 2014, because 2014 marked the centennial of their extinction, and he wanted to revitalize their story because it has a lot of historic significance to modern conservation. I had gotten to know him through a roundabout way of other passenger pigeon fanatics. He learned that at the time in grad school, I was sequencing passenger pigeon DNA, and he said, hey, I was just at this meeting with this brand guy and feeling person, and they want to do what you have always wanted to do. He's like, you got to talk to these people. He sent me a blog post on their first meeting at Harvard of George Church, Beth Shapiro, Scott Edwards, just these incredible people. And the only person's email I could easily find was George Church. I had no idea George Church was a big deal. I had no idea who he was. The people I knew about were in the field of ecology, not biotech. So I just emailed him and I was like, I have passenger pigeon DNA. I would love to just give it to you. And I would love to just help this project any way I can. This is what I've always wanted to do with my life. He forwarded that to Ryan and Stuart. When I woke up the next morning, I had emails from all three of them. And Ryan and Stuart were like, let's talk. That led to my entire career. That's amazing. Wow. You gave us like your interest in the passenger pigeon, but could you just give us the brief overview of how did they go extinct? And like when you describe these 2 billion passenger pigeons flying over a town or a city, what I'm picturing in my mind, it's like I've seen flocks of parrots in Central America. And it's really something that I feel like we see it from a distance when you've got a flock of birds flying, but you don't really get it until you see like a bunch of bright green parrots surrounding a tree. And there's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. So having billions of passenger pigeons flying over a town must have just been amazing. But what led to their extinction? I yeah. just want to add to that question too, is why were people so fanatical about them? What was their story? Because <laughs> I'm mentioning their story. Is like... Yeah, there's a few elements of the story that makes people develop this fanaticism. Part of it is just its connection to Americana. So if you go back to the early 1800s, or even farther if you want, but basically as European colonists began colonizing colonizing America, they immediately witnessed these giant flocks of passenger pigeons. And Europeans were coming from a continent that whose bioabundance had been obliterated for millennia. So North America was just completely astonishing continent to them because the 50 million bison, 5 billion passenger pigeons, it was this incredible cornucopia of life, which they, of course, immediately set about devastating like they did in Europe. But the reason people really gravitate towards it is that billion number. So there were anywhere between three to five billion passenger pigeons in the eastern United States. So the Mississippi and Missouri River Basin East. They were a woodland bird. They nested and lived in forests and they formed these giant flocks all the time. Some species of birds form a big flock to breed and then split up. Some of them form flocks to migrate and then split up. That's actually not very common for species of birds to always be gregarious or social. But passenger pigeons were forming these social flocks 100% of the time. You very rarely saw just one. It was usually thousands to millions to billions of them. One of the largest flocks ever recorded could have been 3.7 billion birds in one flock. It was recorded flying over Toronto in 1860. They calculated this based on how long the flock took to fly over one spot. So they would fly from sun up to sundown for two to three days, sometimes over one spot, just continuous waves of birds. They were noted to block out the sun. Audubon wrote as if by a noonday eclipse. So literally darkening the skies. That's how many birds were filling the sky. And it's just that kind of grandiose nature that they were literally like a storm cloud. If they flew up out of a roost, their wings literally made wind. And then the second element of the story comes in. In 1860, we have about 5 billion passenger pigeons. 25 years later, in 1885, there's hardly any left. So in less than a single human lifetime, this species that was infinite to the people living back then, I mean, you can't register a billion in your brain. You really can't. So, you know, this infinite species, this inexhaustible and endless resource was gone. And there's this great little point of the history where in the Ohio State Legislature, I think it was in the 1850s or 60s, there were people that wanted to protect the species. That's because very early on, because they were so abundant, people began harvesting them for food. Back in the early 1800s, we did not have farms and ranches and poultry farms, etc., like we have today. But there was a constant influx of new colonists and immigrants. So you had this growing human population and not the agricultural infrastructure to feed 
feed them, food companies hired hunters and trappers to go out and harvest wildlife. That's what you would see at a market in New York City in 1860 would have been squirrels, grouse, deer, and lots of passenger pigeons. So passenger pigeons were the cheapest source of protein because they were so easy to get in mass. These hunters and trappers would go out and trap thousands to millions of passenger pigeons a day when they were nesting, when they were moving, etc. All year long, they would move to where these species went. It was the first species in which modern technology, communications technology was used to actually target where they were going. In the early 1860s, when the telegraph lines went up, they used those to let people know like, oh, flock just went by St. Louis heading northeast and the trappers would be out to head them off. The railroad systems that connected made it easier to ship from their rural locations to major markets. This was a species that's demise literally was related to industrialization and modernization, but they thought they were infinite. They could not possibly exhaust this resource. And so in Ohio, the state legislature had this bill to protect them because people saw this constant harvesting and thought, this can't be sustainable. This isn't right. But one of the representatives said the passenger pigeon is so wonderfully prolific. It has the vast forests of the north to breed. It is here today. It will be here tomorrow, etc. Like he had this speech about how they could just never go extinct. And that man was still alive when the last passenger pigeon was gone from Ohio. People literally got to eat their own words. The rapidity of that extinction from going from billions to zero so quickly, the avarice of the human beings hunting them at the time, the way that Europeans took advantage of the indigenous people against them, the many ways that they killed the birds that were really inhumane in many ways, and just the level of the fact that the rarer they got, the more intense the harvesting became. It's very telling that the last passenger pigeon ever seen in the wild was not witnessed, it was shot. So it's just this story of persecution, and that hits a lot of nerves and emotions for people. It's hard to imagine billions. It's hard to imagine a collapse happening so quickly. And it's hard to imagine that level of carnage. And it's a gorgeous bird. That's the other thing I should say. Like if no one has Googled this bird by now, it's very elegant. It's not a street pigeon. The males have this slate blue down the back, little black spots on the wings, both of them, this graduated tail that fans out with rust colors underneath. And the males have this peach rust colored breast when you see them, they're built more like a sports model for those long distance flights. They're gorgeous. You see this incredibly beautiful bird with this incredible story. I think that's what people gravitate towards. That's certainly what Stuart Brand had gravitated towards because he had heard stories of the birds from his grandmother. And looking at the pictures, it is a striking looking beautiful bird, but it also doesn't look like a lot of food. Precisely. It's, it's a pigeon, right? So it's yeah. you eat the breast. It's not a lot of food. So yeah, people ate a lot of them to get a good meal. Here's a question. I know this is a revive and restore project. You guys are talking about restoring the passenger pigeon in captivity, but were you to release them? We've read stories of the plunge in the insect population. Would the passenger pigeon be able to thrive in the wild today? Oh, well, so passenger pigeons primarily ate nuts, seeds and nuts and berries, acorns, beech nut, pine seeds. They actually ate the seeds or berries of 42 different genera of plants. So they're most closely related to the living band-tailed pigeon of the West Coast, and both species eat the same diet. And while they do consume some invertebrates now and then, it's never been consciously observed if that's something happening accidentally, like, oh, there was a grub on a seed that got swallowed. So they shouldn't be much of an issue for insects. And in truth, that gets at a bigger question of the idea of if you restore an extinct species, is the habitat there for it? And that was a question we asked early on. And and I've even been told by people that work in forest management, yeah, there's plenty of forest, there's plenty of habitat for this species. It's a generalist. It was basically somewhat of a super species for this environment. It's incredible that they could be driven to extinction. But I should say, I didn't expect to talk so much about passenger pigeons because they're not the primary part of my work at the moment. They're just part of the history of what we're doing long term. And it will probably be many more years before anyone sees a recreated passenger pigeon or extinct species of any type. Probably the more interesting part of working towards that passenger pigeon was learning about how the technologies we use in other species are going to be more difficult to use in birds and really being like, oh, now we got to start innovating things that are going to help other species and whatnot. 
It's just so fascinating, just the idea of being able to de-extinct. And then just the story of the passenger pigeon. Ecology is also very fascinating. It's this multi-organism system. Just thinking that there were 4 billion or 5 billion of these pigeons that were a part of this system and then they're gone. What effects did it have to the system? What other animals suffered because they weren't there? We don't have to go down that pigeonhole, which now we're going to say for the rest of Um, this podcast. Yeah. Well, I will say for anyone interested in much more in-depth look at the ecology and the science on passenger pigeons. I have a 2021 webinar online that you guys can share the link to. It actually has a great intro talk by Dr. Ian Thompson of the Choctaw Nation. It's a rare chance to get an indigenous perspective on relations and ties to knowledge of the species. And it goes over a lot of the science that we've been putting into this. And it's hard to really solidly and scientifically look at what's happened since the extinction of the passenger pigeon because so many other changes have happened at the same time. But What I will say is that forestry management and ecology has actually proceeded for the last century largely ignorant of the history of passenger pigeons and haven't really accounted for it. So a lot of our forestry knowledge today is incomplete and incorrect, and we don't really know and we're not accounting for it. So because obviously five billion birds had a huge impact, my work, my master's thesis put forth the idea that they were the key ecosystem engineer of eastern forests in that their abundance and they would come in into a patch of forest, and this is that other element of the story that gets to people, they would come in towards the evening, land in a roost area, low light, they're a daylight bird, so they can't see very well. They would overcrowd on branches trying to settle in and break branches from the trees under their weight, break entire trees down to the ground until they settled and largely stabilized. And then when they settled in, they began to poop. A billion birds quickly produces a lot of poop, and it was recorded as being inches to feet deep in a roost area. So they were creating this huge disturbance like a storm and then their guano is snuffing out all of the forest floor life like a fire but on top of that it was also bringing in literal tons of phosphorus nitrogen and other fertilizing components the birds really were acting like a forest fire tornado fertilizer all at once and kick-starting regeneration cycles and they were going somewhere new every few weeks doing this and their nesting sites would be on average 30 square miles up to 100 square miles. A roost could be anywhere from six acres to 120 square miles. They were really responsible for creating a mosaic of successional regenerating forest types across the eastern U.S. And when you examine the adaptations of oak trees, chestnut trees, which are functionally extinct today, but making a comeback thanks to biotech, when you look at all of the amphibians, reptiles, many of the mammals, you look at the unique adaptations of species we think of as the common eastern Eastern forest biota, they all have unique adaptations to living in a disturbance regime forest, which we don't have anymore. Even though we have more forest today in the eastern U.S. than we have for 150 years, thanks to reforestation, thanks to agriculture and mining moving to the western United States and the Midwest, we have plenty of forest cover, but it's not in that dynamic flux of regeneration. And so despite having habitat, we're actually losing a lot of species, dozens of animals to hundreds of plants species are in decline without that. And for the last 60 years now, as this has been recognized, people thought, oh, it must be fire suppression. We need to go out and we need to burn. And burning alone has proven across the board not to work. It's not enough. So people had to start combining fire thinning with shelter wood treatments and things. Slowly, forestry managers have converged on creating the same mechanical effects that passenger pigeons created. But the one thing they don't do is dump a lot of guano on the ground and fertilize. It's still an adequate And the Southern Appalachian burn managers in 2020 set a record for the number of acres they burn. And it was 20,000 acres. And that was in one year. That happens to be the number of acres passenger pigeons would have disturbed every two to three weeks. So when you think about scale in perpetuity, and this is the value proposition of this project, is we want to get back these flocks of millions and billions of passenger pigeons and learn to coexist with that type of bioabundance because the options are either get back the pigeons to do it at scale and do it in a way that co-evolves with the other species beneficially, or keep footing the bill to have hundreds of people go out and do this manually in a way that only gets to about 1% of the landscape that the pigeons could do. It's like we either limp along and continue to lose species and keep this area or this spot on life support or get the pigeons back. And that really gets to this bigger goal of what we want biotech to do for conservation is there's so many species that are alive today that haven't gone 
extinct yet, that are in that limbo of being reliant on human care. We call these conservation reliant species. They don't have enough habitat to be self-sustainable, or they don't have the right interactions in their habitat to be sustainable, or they're being threatened by things like new diseases or climate change in ways that they don't have the actual genetic adaptations to overcome, or they've been bottlenecked to such small populations. Now they've lost the genetic diversity to adapt to that. And these are problems that, well, we can certainly keep these species alive through breeding them in zoos and releasing them or setting up more little protected habitats that has worked really well. And now we're starting to see the limits of it. We're starting to see that setting aside a patch of land here is great until what's living in it has thrived enough that it needs to leave and then it has nowhere to go until climate change comes in and changes the local climate. And once again, they have nowhere to migrate to, nowhere to go. You can keep a species alive in captivity over generations, but if they're constantly being kept alive through breeding, their population can't expand. It starts to lose genetic diversity. It starts to become compromised. The conventional tools we have that have saved dozens and dozens of species across the globe over the last century when faced with somewhat what could be considered conventional threats of habitat loss, degradation, or hunting are things that can be solved with regulations, changes in policy, changes in human behavior, changes in the types of products we use and how we do things. And then there are these new threats that have been growing over the past 500 years of invasive species, disease, and now the last few decades of climate change that those conventional measures just can't fix. So to get off of that life support, we need to actually start incorporating biotechnology because it does offer solutions to create actual sustainable management practices. And that can become the form of recreating a passenger pigeon for one environment. But in most cases, it's going to be helping the endangered species that are having an issue in that environment. I know we want to talk about all the other programs and other animals. I mean, just <laughs> the passenger pigeon is so fascinating now that you shared all those stories. And it's a good anchor to talk about, first of all, how animals play a role in our earth and they have a job, you know, they're doing a certain job. And it's a program that you guys are working on. I'm just curious, how far along are you? Like, when will we see passenger pigeons? Oh, when we started Revive and Restore, we said very ambitiously, 10 years. And if you're keeping track, that would have been last year. And if we had had passenger pigeons last year, there would be one sitting on my shoulder during this interview. So we're obviously not there yet. And part of that is that there were not really interested donors in the project. In our first 10 years, we were able to actually grow from the idea of a passenger pigeon project into an institution funding over 40 active projects around the world because there was high interest in helping endangered species. 10 of our projects are involved in helping coral reefs, creating stem cells for regeneration, probiotic treatments based on genomic information, understanding what makes a susceptible versus a hardy coral and the threat of heat, stress and other things. Projects understanding the genomics of species like sea stars on the West Coast that are affected by disease to our programs that are arguably the first real conservation cloning programs with the endangered black-footed ferret and Chevalsky's horse that are actually reaching back in the biobanks and taking out those cells and going, ah, we can actually bring back genetic diversity as long as we have it stored away and prepared for the future. But like we were able to get money for that and build that way, partly because, as I said kind of earlier, there was such an open space. These are tools that are entirely foreign to most people working in conservation. And just basic genomics was completely underutilized. People often didn't have much familiarity with it or thought it was too expensive. And as the prices were dropping, we were like, we could fill this role and get in and help assist this. And funders could see that. It was important just to bring people together, people from biotech with conservationists at meetings and be like, hey, talk to each other. Let's learn from each other. And we began this unique format of workshop where I don't know if you've ever been to a scientific conference, but it's kind of like just a science fair show and tell for grownups. Everybody shares whatever work they're willing to publicly share so that their publications don't get scooped. But they're like, this is what my lab has been doing. And then the people talk and I guarantee every conference creates new collaborations. People meet each other and go, let's work on this together. Conferences are a show and tell environment. We wanted our workshops to actually make those relationships happen. So at our first genomics workshop in 2015, after we'd realized trying to make de-extinction happen, that we just have to start at baby step one. What can people use genomics for? We know what it's doing for medicine. We know that there's a few early adopters in conservation. Let's get them at the table with the biotech people. Let's talk about this stuff. So in 2015, yeah, we had the genomic solutions for conservation meeting and we took 30 some 
40 some people from around the world and said, we're going to break you down into groups. And over the next three days, you have to create a project and a full pitch for funding. And at the end of this conference, you're going to pitch that in front of a mock panel of funders. And those were real funders. We had people from industry, DARPA, et cetera, that agreed to come and just sit and give them real feedback. And this was in combination with the show and tell sessions. So we had people getting up there, sharing their work, people sharing, what is the state of conservation in biotech? People going, oh, wow, I never knew. And then biotech people getting up there and going, look what we did with a lab mouse. And people from conservation going, holy. And so then rather than letting them just passively over drinks, be like, what could we work on together? It was now you get into your breakdown group and you have to create a project together. One group on disease, one group on genetic diversity, et cetera. Actual real projects came out of that. And they ended up actually getting funding from some of the even sources that were the mock panel. And we have continued that. So we've continued that style of meeting. Our next meeting is coming up in September on stem cells because stem cells are, I think, really the future of all biotech and conservation for many reasons. And they haven't really advanced that much beyond human use. So we think that's kind of like the next big frontier. Once again, we'll be breaking people down into groups and going, make something happen. And maybe a program will come out of that. Maybe not. We'll see. But it was that dynamic of how we changed bringing people together that started attracting the funding and making us realize there is a larger community of people that want to use and develop these technologies, but they need money. There was interest in funders for us to basically put money in us and go, you be the funding agency, take our money and you make it do something good. So that's what we've been able to do over the last 10 years. And so, of course, passenger pigeons didn't make a lot of progress. I do believe that's changing now just because partly because after 10 years, technology is moving forward. But in the goal of getting towards passenger pigeons, as I said kind of earlier, it was obvious that there are technologies that can't be used in birds that we use in mammals, things like cloning. You cannot clone a bird because of the way the egg forms, the way eggs are, hard shelled eggs. There's other technologies people use in chickens. So once again, this really came down to there are people in biotech using this technology in chickens and people in conservation facing major issues. So in 2021, rather than talk about passenger pigeon de-extinction anymore for a little bit, I brought together those people at a meeting. And this was virtual, so we really didn't get to do the breakout stuff, but it was really aimed towards developing a community of biotechnologists and conservationists that could start really thinking through what are the projects we need to do to make biotechnology work in birds and make it applicable to conservation because what works for for a chicken in a lab has nothing to do with the parameters you're faced with a wild species on a tropical island or in a semi-arid desert in South America. That meeting once again spurred a donor to bring in and put in money. And so in 2022, we were able to launch the program while none of our projects are passenger pigeon projects specifically at the moment, they are all going to create foundational technologies that make the future of passenger pigeons more realistic. I caution myself away from saying now we're only 10 years away from passenger pigeons. I would love to say that. All I'm going to say is I'm, I'm very optimistic that the science is going to move along. And not only is it going to enable us to actually recreate passenger pigeons while I continue to sort through the ecology and whatnot and bits like that, but it's going to actually yield some of those early projects with endangered birds that are really going to transform the space. That's great, Ben. There's so many things to unpack. A lot of what you've talked about just reminds me specifically about the interconnectedness of, of nature and in the world that we live in. We, at least I say it, and Aram has heard me say this, and other people in biotech have heard me say it. It's like, you can't be in biotech without being a conservationist. On the one hand, I'll say, yeah, we need the library that nature's given us. But on the other hand, we need nature to help us rebuild nature. But I'm kind of curious from your point of view, we're living in a climate crisis. We are seeing mass extinction. How does that change the priorities that Revive and Restore is working on? You mentioned coral yeah. reefs. How does that impact the way you guys think about the projects you guys are working on? I will say that probably our most important program right now is the informed biobanking program. In 2020, with the birth of Elizabeth Ann, the black-footed ferret, the first time a U.S. endangered species had been cloned, not only cloned, but also cloned from cells that had been cryopreserved in 1988. To give perspective, I was one year old when those cells were frozen at the San Diego Frozen Zoo, 32 years later, brought out of the freezer and produced a living, beautiful animal that is unrelated to all living black-footed ferrets. Like there's a solid story there. It was only possible because somebody back in 1988 sent a tissue sample when the original animal named Willa died, sent a bit of skin to Oliver Ryder at the frozen zoo. That was Tom Thorne. That was the veterinarian that did that. And Oliver Ryder's team were able to make a cell line and freeze it away. 
if we don't save biosamples in a way that enables those technologies in the future, then we won't have any options for restoration. And you can think of this in terms of passenger pigeons. I can't resurrect passenger pigeons from a cell line. They went extinct before that technology ever existed. So we're forced with this idea of having to re-engineer them. And that's incredibly complex. It leads many people to question whether or not it's even a genuine thing to recreate a passenger pigeon. And we know we can't create an exact copy of a passenger pigeon, but we can get something that's maybe functionally equivalent. We did create an exact copy of Willa the ferret that lived in 1988 because they saved her cells. And there are cells of a thousand species, several hundred of them endangered species in the frozen zoo in San Diego. There are tissue samples and other biobanks around the world. But something we learned after cloning Elizabeth Ann, when people were like, wow, you can really use these biobanks to do something. And the birth of Kurt, the Chevalsky's horse, another endangered species born from cells from 1980, who you can see at the San Diego Zoo. If you get the Asian Savannah Safari tour, you might get lucky enough to see Kurt. He's really cool. And his genetic twin brother, who is on his way shortly to San Diego Zoo. That's the new clone from his line. I should say, I should tote that. We've got two clones from that line now, thanks to our work with Viagen, which is an incredible company, and San Diego Zoo. But anyway, these two projects showing that you could reach back in the bank, go forward decades and do something with it really started impressing upon people the need to do that, especially now with climate change. I mean, we have some populations so rapidly declining. Every time you lose an individual, you use a little bit of unique diversity. If you don't bank some of that material, some sperm, some eggs, some skin tissue, a cell line, then you lose that forever. When we looked at the endangered species in the United States, we found that fewer than 14% of the 1,500 plus listed endangered native U.S. species had any kind of biobanked material. And there was no standard for that biobanked material. It could be a piece of tissue frozen away. It could be a cell line. It could be sperm. It could be just DNA that people extracted, which you can sequence for a genome, but you can't resurrect from. So you need living cells in a good manner. So we started having conversations with Fish and Wildlife Service. There was clearly interest in expanding biobanking, maybe making it a standard part of recovery actions. But there were a lot of questions. This is not something that their field biologists and their managers routinely do. So there's a lot of records and kinks to work out. And I'm really happy to say that under the leadership of Pete Miraglia, our deputy director, and the initial work of Michelle Weber, our former conservation innovation director, that program took off and has an official pilot program memo with Fish and Wildlife Service working on biobanking tissues and cell lines of mammals to start with, because that's where we have most technology. Jackie Mountcastle, our consultant on that work, has produced this kind of document, which is available on our website, on where the white spaces with other taxa. It's very informative. We've been developing actual protocols that anybody can get online and look at pictures and go step by step that if you really wanted to go out in your backyard and do this, I don't recommend that. You need federal and state permits to handle wildlife. But if you as a person wanted to apply for a federal or state level permit to go out and take tissue samples of a particular species, we have the protocols online that would and should enable you to do that in a high quality manner. And just taking the stuff that San Diego Zoo has been doing for decades really well and starting to make it and put it in the hands of the people in the service. San Diego Zoo is one of the partners helping us put away these samples. Viagen Pets and Equine is helping us create cell lines and put away these samples and they're going to the USDA federal repository, which has mainly been for agriculture, but is accepting all this wildlife stuff. And we need to do more of that. And for decades, people have thought that biobanking is admitting defeat. It's like, okay, well, we're just admitting we can't save these species. I think think we're at the point where we need to admit that and go climate change is happening so rapidly, so much faster than the previous models had anticipated that if we don't biobank, that's actually admitting defeat because now we're not even going to prepare. And I say that because I know that we can restore nature. There are tons of environments that have literally been restored from the ground up. Farm fields turned back into wetlands, deforested areas turned back into savannas and forests, species re 
reintroduced to regions after being gone for hundreds to thousands of years. We know restoration can work with enough grunt work and the resources. And if we don't create those resources now, then we don't have that option in the future. And so while this is a, some might say pessimistic, I think it's a pragmatic view that we've really embraced at Revive and Restore. We recognize pragmatically, we are going to lose more species than we save in the coming decades, but we know restoration can work. And I believe the world will figure out how to get a handle on the climate crisis, possibly even cool things down. And if we have the right biobanked materials and we create right now the biotechnologies with model species and other species that we need to actually use those materials in the future, we will have every option for restoration. And I should at least venture optimistically that I do hope we end up saving a lot of species from extinction because people are working really hard at that. It is really bleak in some areas. I think it's important to recognize how hard conservationists out in the field are fighting right now to save species in the face of really dire threats. Yeah, what this reminds me of is like we started off, you were talking about growing up near the Theodore Roosevelt National Park forest. And I seem to remember because I had done some reading about Theodore Roosevelt. And it seems like when he was very young, I think his father gave him a shotgun when he was nine or maybe younger. But it seemed like there was this movement that was very popular among young boys to catch and hunt and catalog the species that they were catching and hunting. And maybe they were sending them to the predecessor to the Smithsonian. And he was famous for having this huge bird collection, animal collection in his apartment in New York City. And I believe that that was because there was a series of books that was aimed at boys. And that's where they all got the idea that they should be out hunting and cataloging species of the American plains. You could hunt or you could be like a gentrified hunter and do natural history at the same time. And yes, there was a paper that called for a revival of natural history in that manner, which was an okay paper. But my criticism of it is we need to revive the idea of natural history in a way that doesn't kill the organisms. Right. And that's our main push with Fish and Wildlife Service and biobanking is we need to take these samples in a non-lethal manner or a manner that when a specimen is found deceased takes advantage of that opportunity. So there needs to be both opportunity and strategy that builds in that welfare so that hopefully these species can continue to thrive while we're getting that necessary information, photographs of them, bits of samples for their genome, cells for potential reproduction. So incredible. I have so many questions for you. I know we're up on time, but I just wanted to make some comments and feel free to add to it. But biobanking reminds me of zoo, right? The San Diego Zoo, rather than having cells or eggs or sperm of these animals, you actually have the animal and you keep them captive. But that's an issue too, because then they're in this constrained environment. And it led me to think, if you do have these cells that are frozen and then you revive them, what are the behaviors that they learn? So it's very interesting to me because I think back to a very interesting movie called In Sino Man. I don't know if you've ever heard of that movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Where yeah. it's, <laughs> it's about a caveman. It's thought out and it comes back to life from the ice age now to modern times. And he and, just revived his career. Yeah, isn't it, yeah. Isn't it time for a sequel? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there should be. So the behavior, like he didn't know what to eat. He didn't know how to interact yeah. in this new environment. So even for these animals, I'm also curious specifically about the black-footed ferret. Now that it's revived, does it behave the same way as the previous, as ancestors? It's just something that I was really thinking about. If you bring them back to life, who's going to train them if they don't have their society or the education, the culture of what these animals have experienced and grew? I think the history of California condor conservation is a great example to look at because in truth, we don't know. The scientific thing to say is we don't know. And that's partly because we don't have the ecological history of any species on this planet. We have great notes for some of them and we have great science from the past hundred years for some species. But the last hundred years is after centuries of degradation. So we do not have an actual ecological history of the behavior and dynamics of species in their environments before human change. We don't actually have catalogs of the natural role humans were playing with those species for tens to hundreds of thousands of years because humans were the main engineer and predator on this planet for the past 300,000 years. When those Europeans got to North America, passenger pigeons had been living with human beings for 15,000 years. We tend to forget that. 
And we don't have that history to compare to. So is a reintroduced black-footed ferret that was bred in captivity just like a natural black-footed ferret from 300 years ago? We can't answer it. But what we can say is that they thrive in the environment today when they're put out there. When they're free of disease and their habitat is intact, they do great. They actually do better in the wild than they do in captivity. And this is genetics studies and things coming out of Bradley Swanson's lab and working with Travis Livieri and others in the recovery team have actually shown that black-footed ferrets breeding in the wild choose better mates on their own than the computer programs they use in the pedigree in captivity, which is using genealogy, et cetera, trying to make them the best they can. They're doing it better on their own in the wild. California condors have displayed a number of behaviors that were never witnessed historically. And there was a man that spent years living with condors and writing it down. We don't know if these are new behaviors or if these are old behaviors, because one of the best things about California California condors that I love so much, which just recently happened with giant tortoise. And for contrast, when black-footed ferrets were brought into captivity, a ferret lives two to three years. In captivity, they can live up to eight years or longer sometimes, but they don't live that long. None of the original animals that were captured from the wild ever went back to the wild. They died in captivity after producing lots of offspring and doing their part to save their species. The last California condor ever captured in the wild, whose name was Igor, caught on Easter Sunday, 1987, when I was just a couple months old. In 2002, after producing a whole bunch of babies in captivity, he was released back to the wild. And so he lived the rest of his life as a wild animal again. But he had spent over a decade in captivity. He started doing something in the wild that was never thought to be a natural behavior for the species, he began leading young captive bred condors, teaching them how to be wild. Wow. And we don't know if that was something that parent condors and adult condors did with young condors. We don't know if it happened because Igor was captive and then released. We don't know. But all I'll say is, and this is to quote Jurassic Park in a good way, nature finds a way if we do our part to give it the chance. Nature will take care of itself as long as we prop it up. When I hear those questions, I'm not overly concerned a lot with it because there are growing pains to figuring out how to restore species and it's very complicated. In an ideal world, we would create a biobank that never has to be used because we should be doing, this is our motto at Revive and Restore, is use every tool in the toolkit. We need to be protecting habitat, restoring more habitat, saving species species where they're at now, bringing some into captivity in zoos so that we always have them breeding because we get to learn more. We could not have cloned a black-footed ferret or Shabalski's horse, even using their domestic counterparts the way we did. Kurt and his twin brother now were born from domestic horses. Elizabeth Ann, the black-footed ferret, was born to a domestic ferret. We wouldn't have been able to do all of that had there not been decades of people actually breeding those animals in captivity and learning about their reproduction and their behavior. We need to study these species in the wild. We need to bring them into our zoos and facilities and study them there and have reassurance populations. We need to have biobanks of their cells that represent wild and captive bred animals to maintain an insurance policy of diversity. And we need to protect them, create laws that ban fishing or trapping in certain marine areas. We need better stuff all around. And to do that, what we absolutely really need in addition to solving climate change. And this is going to be a tall order, but we literally need to change everything about humanity globally, how we get food, how we build infrastructure, produce energy. There's nothing about how we live that we cannot change. It's the foundation. We don't have to change how we live our day-to-day -day lives, but everything about the manufacturing of products, where they come from, how they're recycled, where the energy comes from, all that has to change to create coexistence. And to do that, we need something that we just don't have right now. And that is a public and political, and that's most importantly, political will at national levels to make that change happen. Right now, there is no government in the world that is taking any of this seriously. And they're only starting to take the climate crisis seriously because it's affecting their voting base. And that's really sad to me as someone who was raised conservative, leans liberal, etc. I think it's easy in the United States to target kind of the Republican Party and be like, you've been denying climate change. The Democrat Party knew about it for 50 years and did nothing, did absolutely nothing. We've known about climate change since the 1970s. We've had solid science since the 1970s. And the entire world chose to just have a blind eye and rely on maybe a few corporations coming up with some pet projects that never go into mass production to try and do something about it. And we're at the point now that it has to be urgent and it has to be immediate.
I learned just yesterday about one of the reasons this has to be urgent. We are looking at how we can help amphibians. We have some projects with genomics on amphibians, but we want to see where else biotechnology can help amphibians. And there's the Puerto Rican crested toad, which now has a lot of frogs being bred in zoos, like the Fort Worth Zoo and others. And they have used biotech to help that species. They collected sperm from wild animals, froze it in the field, brought it back to the zoo and produced offspring with the females in the zoo. Cool stuff. The breeding ponds that they use in the wild in Puerto Rico are becoming contaminated with salt because of sea level rise. Literally any day now, they won't have any wild habitat anymore. That's extremely urgent. That's a very clear cut case where climate change is affecting an individual species, but it's really affecting everything all around the world. We just had articles going out about the coral crisis in Florida. We're going to see more of this. The fires in Australia devastated wildlife. The fires happening in Canada are devastating wildlife. We don't have biobanks. We don't have the tools. We don't have it already in set. We have to move urgently on this stuff. And so I hope that definitely prompts some people to support World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, the big guys, and support us because we are the only ones really pushing and developing the biotech tools that are going to be necessary for a lot of this. I think that's great. I think it's a great way to wrap up this episode. It's been so fascinating. I still have all these questions to ask you, so we'll have to bring you back on. I think it's just phenomenal. We will support Revive and Restore by getting the word out. Hopefully our listeners feel the sense of urgency. I think in a parallel universe, Al Gore was president. <laughs> he won that election. And we do have a healthy, revived planet in that parallel universe. We don't live in that one right now. So we have to do what we can in order to revive and restore our planet. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so second. much. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben. Really appreciate it. So, Carl, what did you think of the interview? I mean, Ben is amazing. We live in a crazy time. The fact that we can even be thinking about using biotechnology to bring back extinct species to help with conservation issues is amazing to me. What did you think? I was a little disappointed in terms of the fact that we're still waiting on the passenger pigeon to be revived and restored. And it really sounds like the main thing that's holding them back is the lack of funding. Yeah. You know, they need more funds, they need more people. And I really hope people were inspired by this interview because there's a lot that is possible. We do need to revive some of these species. The amount of value the passenger pigeon had on our ecology, especially here in North America, is tremendous. I really appreciate the fact that Ben had so much knowledge in the space and he was saying, Yes, there's controlled burns to help regenerate the forest, but those controlled burns, they only impact 1% of forests. The process we have is not reaching all acres of forest that need to be regenerated. And it was the billions of passenger pigeons that were able to do the type of regeneration of forests at a larger scale because there were billions of them. There weren't just a handful of people that were doing controlled burns. And it's not just controlled burns because that's one aspect. We still need to introduce all those microbes back into the environment which the passenger pigeons were doing with their tons and tons of guano that they were just dropping all over these forests. To look at the role of passenger pigeons in the regeneration of forests, I thought was very interesting. Ben is such a great storyteller. The way that he described life back in the day when it was peak passenger pigeons was very vivid. So yeah. I was just sitting there with my head in my hands, just like, wow, it was so great. I was so taken back by the story that passenger pigeons and everything else Revive and Restore is doing. Yeah, I think it's super interesting. I love the fact that the tools are getting easier to use and are cheaper. And it just makes me wonder if some independent biohackers are going to start coming along and de-extincting species and releasing them into the wild. Ben started off the interview saying that he grew up near Theodore Roosevelt National Forest in North Dakota. And he talked a lot about biobanking, which is something that Andrew Hessel talked about in an earlier podcast. What's interesting to me is I read one biography of Theodore Roosevelt. And he, at the time of growing up, which is post-Civil War in New York City, he and most boys of that time, those that read, were reading a lot about the frontier. He was very inspired by the frontier. He was given a shotgun at a very young age. And part of conservation for them was this idea of cataloging species. So he was known for having a wild, extensive collection of animals that he had preserved in his New York City apartment. If I said it was thousands of animals, I would not be off by that much. We only have something 
something like 14% of the 1,500 U.S. endangered species biobanked. So we can really use some more biobanking efforts. And what I think about is Theodore Roosevelt was, and all these boys were inspired to collect these animal specimens because they were reading about these animal specimens and they knew that there was a need to understand the nature that they were living in. And so we maybe need some kind of marketing campaign around helping to collect more species and getting the biobanks more complete because a lot of these things are going to disappear in the face of climate change. I would say that, you know, when you mentioned that in the episode, Ben's response about Theodore Roosevelt is that they killed all those animals. We need they animals did. They would kill alive. them. It's true. It was helpful in terms of like knowing that they existed, but in terms of informed biobanking, that wasn't as helpful because we need live specimens that then become frozen or sent to the frozen zoo, which I think that was really interesting that he mentioned at the San Diego Zoo or elsewhere. It's really great that Revive and Restore, they do have this campaign or this effort for informed biobanking. If you are inspired by doing it, you do need federal and state permits to handle wildlife. But if you get those permits, you can go on Revive and Restore's website and grab the biobanking protocols and do it. Like you would be doing a great service to the biodiversity of at least the U.S. But if you are in a different country, you should look into it, see what your country is doing in terms of promoting and saving the biodiversity. And maybe you can start that initiative. And if you do, please let us know. I mean, that would be great. In terms of that biodiversity and being able to revive and restore, he mentioned a couple of animals. One was a black-footed ferret and the other was a horse, Zwalski's horse. And they actually partnered with another company called Viagen. And Viagen is a company, I think the tagline is like restoring the animals you love or reviving the animals you love. They can clone your pets, but obviously they have the cloning technology and they worked with Revive and Store to clone horse. So I think that's really cool. I think we should have someone from Biogen on the podcast. Like, what do they have in their roadmap in terms of what animals are they cloning? They're talking about pets. I'm sure they're dogs and cats. Yeah, certain dogs and I, cats. Have, I looked at know. once, I think it's $10,000 to clone your cat. Hey, people have the money. You know, owning pet can cost a lot of pricey. money. Yeah. So they might see the value of 10 grand and cloning the animal that you love. Uh, and I wonder if, again, like the whole idea of like the behavior is uh, really interesting. This has been a really great episode. I love this whole concept of Revive and Restore. I'm excited to see what animals this organization will be focusing on. I love the Coral Reef Initiative. We have all of their information in the show notes. Please donate to them. If you feel inspired that you're working for this cause of reviving, restoring our endangered and extinct species. So please consider donating to Revive and Restore. Just a reminder, we do have a hotline now. If you'd like to call with any questions or comments or recommendations or people you think we should be talking to and including, please do give us a call. The phone number is 804-505-5553. That's 804-505-5553. You can also text us at that number. I wanted to give a shout out to my sister, Samina, who's been listening to every episode and she doesn't call the number. She calls me directly and has comments. I'm sure she's going to listen to this episode. I want to tell her that I love you. Thanks, Amina. We appreciate it. All right. That's the pot. 